Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nora Atkinson. I'm the Fleur and Charles Bressler Curator in Charge of the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I'm delighted you're all with, with us here tonight to join us for the conversation with Roland Ricketts, which we are presenting joint, jointly with the George Washington University Museum and the Textile Museum. Although the Renwick is currently closed to the public, this program is in conjunction with our current exhibition, Forces of Nature, the Renwick Invitational 2020, which features four artists, Roland Ricketts, Lauren Fensterstock, Deborah Moore, and Timothy Horn, who create exquisite larger-than-life works ruminating on nature and humankind's place in it. And you can see more about the show on our website. We should have video interviews with each of the artists going up shortly, if not already, and I'm actually excited to announce that we also just had a video crew come to the gallery to document Roland's work for several hours. So that film is being edited and that should also be on our website and YouTube channel soon. There's a gorgeous catalog for this exhibition also available, which can be purchased on our website if you're interested in learning more. Um, so please join us on our website and see everything that we have to offer. Now, just to give you a little background on the exhibition, the Renwick Invitational series began 20 years ago with an exhibition called Five Women in Craft, which aimed to highlight emerging and mid-career artists in the field deserving of broader national attention. It's a roughly biennial juried exhibition, always headed by a Renwick curator. This year, I was delighted to be joined by Stefano Catalani, Executive Director of Gage Academy of Art, and Emily Zilber, the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Wharton Eschrick Museum, whom I asked to guest curate the show and who said yes, uh, for which I am forever grateful. Thank you, Emily. So you'll be hearing uh, from Emily shortly. And I also wanted to thank Roland Ricketts for his amazing work and for being part of this exhibition, despite the challenges of putting on a show in the current environment. Uh, we have reworked the original schedule of the show. So it's now going to be up through June of next year. So hopefully we will reopen and some of you will get a chance to see it in person. Um, it's really something to get a chance to experience Roland's piece in situ, as I imagine you will understand after this program. I'd also like to thank Rhina and Melvin Cohen Family Foundation, whose endowment provides support for the Renwick Invitational Series. The Carol and Small Alber Exhibitions Fund, Kathy and Ed Fries, Carrie J. Fries, Vanis and Cecily Hudson, the James Renwick Alliance, Chlorfine Foundation, Rizzo Litvizo Moray, Eleanor Rosenfeld, Myra and Harold Weiss, and finally the Tokushima Prefecture. And I understand through the magic of Zoom, we actually have several folks from Japan on the call tonight. Uh, so I would really like to thank you and welcome you to the program. And with that said, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague at the Textile Museum, Curator of Contemporary Art, Carolyn Kipp. Carolyn, thanks so much for partnering with us and I leave it to you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Nora. Um, the George Washington University Museum and the Textile Museum is so excited to be collaborating with the Smithsonian American Art Museum and Renwick Gallery to highlight the amazing work of Roland Ricketts and Emily Zilber. Before I introduce tonight's stars, I'd just like to take a moment and thank all of the staff at SAM, and in particular, Gloria Kenyon, without whom this program would not be possible. And with that, on to the guests of honor. It's my pleasure to introduce the brilliant Emily Zilber, whom I feel infinitely fortunate to have started under at the MFA Boston. Emily Zilber is a curator, educator, writer, and arts administrator. Emily served as the guest curator for Forces of Nature, Renwick Invitational 2020. She's also the director of curatorial affairs and strategic partnerships at the Wharton Eschrick Museum, maintains an independent consulting practice and teaches at Tyler School of Art and Architecture. From 2010 to 2018, Emily was the first Warnick curator of contemporary decorative arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And prior to that, assistant curator at Cranbrook Academy of Art and Art Museum. Emily holds a BA in art history from the University of Chicago and an MA in the history of decorative arts and design from the Bard Graduate Center. Tonight, Emily will be in conversation with forces of nature artist Roland Ricketts. Roland Ricketts utilizes natural dyes and historical processes to create contemporary textiles that span art and design. Trained in indigo farming and dyeing in Japan, Roland received his MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2005 
and is currently an associate professor in the School of Art, Architecture, and Design at Indiana University. His work has been exhibited at the Textile Museum in Washington, DC, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Seattle Asian Art Museum, and he has been recognized with a 2012 United States Artist Fellowship. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Emily and Roland, and I'll rejoin you at the end of the conversation to moderate questions from the audience. Thank you, Caroline, uh, Nora, and the teams at the Textile Museum in the Renwick for inviting Roland and I to be part of this conversation. I am so thrilled that Roland is part of this year's Renwick Invitational, his singular approach to thinking about how nature and art intersect, connected so strongly with this year's bigger theme. And I hope you'll be able to see Forces of Nature once the museum reopens again to the public. Um, I wanna start our conversation tonight, Roland, with the installation that first brought you and I together, mobile sections. And you're seeing an image of that here. This was a commission we worked on together for the exhibition Objects in Flux at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in 2015, which then traveled to the Seattle Art Museum for the exhibition Mood Indigo. And we're seeing an installation shot here from that um, exhibition. I think this particular piece gets at so much of what's compelling and unique about your practice, this marriage of natural elements and historically informed processes to contemporary art practices like installation and sound art. Um, and I think this piece is also a really interesting precursor to the, to the work that's in the Renwick exhibition. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about, about this piece as a way of introducing your work to, the, to, our, to our group tonight. Yes, uh, and I, I also just want to um, also say thanks to everyone who's worked not only to put the uh, exhibitions together, but the, the program tonight and everyone who's joined us. Um, so this, uh, this work, Mobile Section, the title of this comes from uh, 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 Gilles Deleuze um, sort of idea that an artwork can't ever really represent a whole. You can never really capture a whole experience of something in an artwork. And at the same time, you can't really understand the artwork by taking it apart into its various uh, sections or by breaking it down into its individual parts. And so for me, my feel that this is very true to a lot of the work that I do and that's really encapsulated here is that you have these various elements. Um, you know, I start, uh, I start um, with a handful of seeds each spring and um, grow the, the plants that I then process into the dye and, and turn into uh, color on cloth. And there's all these various parts, but it's not that simple of a, um, in looking at any one step of that, you never really understand even the whole of that process. Um, and then uh, next image, please. Uh, I think that you'll, um, eat, as you have these various, um, parts as they come together, um, they, they can never really capture the whole. So uh, this, this uh, project was actually inspired, the form in the center was inspired by grain bins, which are really ubiquitous. I live in Bloomington, Indiana, and all around us, there's lots of, uh, lots of um, farms where people are, a uh, lot of corn and soy being grown, and it's often stored in these grain bins. And so I was, I was sort of thinking about, um, thinking about a form to use as a, as a container and sort of struck upon the grain bin because um, it's, it's, it's a very simple form and yet it's it can, what it contains when it contains grain, when you think about what grain actually is and its history with, within human evolution and the various varieties of grains that are grown around the world, the sort of technologies that they represent and the, the passing on of generational knowledge that's embodied in them. Um, it seemed like a really interesting form to work with. And then um, in this case, instead of having the harvested plants in, inside the vessel, the vessel's actually made of the, the color and what's caught inside is the, the light. Um, because one of the things that I think is really um, interesting to me as an artist is that I, I work through this very long process of growing and processing dye to end up with something that is immaterial. It's uh, a, a reflection of a specific wavelength of light that we see as blue. 
but really it's so much more than that. And in looking at the plants, you don't fully understand that. And looking at the color, you don't fully understand that history and all the connections that it has, um, but they're still there. I think um, one of the things that, that struck me so much about this work was the way that you can really feel enveloped um, by this. And so you can see in the image here that, that people can walk inside, that, that they can sort of engage with the work in that way. Um, in the installation we had at the, in Boston, you really could feel completely immersed because of the, the scale of the room that the piece was in. And I'm, and I'm, I think this, this image here gives a nice, <laughs> a nice sense of, of how, um, that sort of feeling of being inside a color, that feeling of being inside indigo, um, really comes through strongly when, when, when you engage with this work. And I'm, you know, curious if you can talk a little bit about what it is about indigo that makes it this medium and topic that, that you've wanted to engage with for this whole long length of your career. Well, I, you know, on some level, I really didn't know that I wanted to engage with it for <laughs> this long when I started. Um, it's something that it is you step into it more, there's more, there's, it seems like there's always infinitely more to learn. Um, indigo has been used by uh, people around the world for thousands and thousands of years. So there's, um, you know, it, it traces a lot of uh, connections and uh, embodies a lot of complexities um, and contradictions um, that are, serve as a really wonderful sort of mirror back on us as, as people and sort of what it, on some very basic level, what it means to be human. I also think that, you know, um, there is this enveloping nature for, for me in that so much of my, my day-to-day -day, um, routine is dictated by uh, the needs of this, the, the plant or the process, right? So there's in the spring, we have to, to transplant. We were, you know, gathering and winn winnowing seeds recently for planting next year. Um, uh, composting in the fall and winter, um, or even just tending the vats because the vats are living and every day they need to be stirred. Um, so there's really sort of, it's a, it, as a process, it's a very immersive one that's also part of my day-to-day -day life as it has been for, you know, who knows, millions of other people across time who, who have worked with this, this uh, color and the various plants that produce it. Well, and it's interesting too, because you have this cyclical engagement with indigo, right? You know that there are certain markers in time that are going to mean that you're engaging with, with the process in a certain way. And on, on the other hand, you have this parallel track that intersects of, of museum exhibitions of teaching and, and figuring out the juxtaposition of one rhythm against another must, must be something that, that you know, comes up in your, in your thought process. Yeah, it's often discordant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in competition with each other. Uh, it's, um, but it is, you know, it's uh, it's just part of that that reality of living, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I think, yeah, I think um, it, in some ways it must be comforting to have the the sort of familiar cycles of indigo right now. Um, in this very unusual year, you know, you're still doing the things that, that you would do, I assume, in, <laughs> yeah, in very, December and in winter to, to make sure that you're, you're ready for, for the next time that you want to make something. Absolutely. And it's been really, um, it's been something sort of comforting and reassuring about um, its sort of steadfastness there. You just have to, like I said, it dictates what you have to do when, um, and it doesn't, it really doesn't care if there's a global pandemic on or not. You have to harvest it. You have to gather the seeds. Um, it's very, yeah, in, on that, in, in that way, it's very grounding. I think one of the things that, that visitors who saw mobile sections really um, reacted most strongly to was the fact that Indigo was brought into the gallery in both iterations of the installation. And, and if we can go to the next, um, we have a little video that shows a time lapse of um, building the indigo wall here in Boston. Um, Roland, can you talk a little bit about this, you know, desire to have the the sort of dyed cloth and the actual plant together in installations? 
Yeah, this this grew out of the, <laughs> out of an experience in grad school um, where I kept dying things and putting them up and was like, it's all in there. It's all in there. And people are like, no, it's just blue. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's not all. And realizing that um, for me in working through this process, I, I have um, a lot of, obviously a lot of contact with these plants. Um, and there's certain aspects of them that you, that you just can't understand unless you experience the plants firsthand. They have a very sweet smell, sort of like hay. Um, and I, I also think um, so, so there's there's this sort of uh, sensory experience of the plants um, in the in the space, but then having them juxtaposed with cloth with dyed cloth, I think, is really powerful because um, I think a lot of times we don't we don't understand where things come from, mm -hmm. um, and e everything sort of has a story to to tell. Um, and so by juxtaposing the, the plants with the dyed cloth, my hope is that it, it gets people thinking about like, whoa, wait, that, is, that, is that where the color comes from? The leaves are distinctly blue. Um, so it's, it's pretty evident. And you think, well, that's where, the, that's where the color comes from. How does it get there? How do people figure this out? Um, and start sort of asking those, those questions, not just about what they're seeing in the, in the gallery, um, in the work, but when they go back out into the world with any other object that they, they come into contact with. I think for many, many folks who saw this indigo wall um, in the installation in Boston, just even sort of registering that, okay, this is a plant that makes this color was, was new for, for some folks. And um, I think for those of us who, who, who think about textiles and who think about how they're produced, um, uh, that can feel, you know, like common knowledge, and it really isn't for many people. Um, I think I'm also, you know, thinking about everyone who came in and and did have that experience of smelling the indigo, and even if they hadn't had that relationship with indigo in the past. Um, it reminded them of some experience they'd had in nature in the context of, 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 an, of the outdoors, that, that that smell was evocative, even if this was their first time encountering an indigo plant um, specifically. Um, we're showing here your, the, the fields in, in Indiana. So can you talk a little bit about the process and about um, the, work that, the work that you do? Yeah, so this is, um, this is uh, some indigo that uh, was grown on a friend of mine's farm outside Bloomington. Um, this is not at our house, uh, mm -hmm. at a fellow named Jeff Hartenfeld's place. Um, and uh, we grow um, uh, at home. Uh, we've worked with other farmers in the area, to uh, small farms to, to grow indigo. And we're um, right now we're also growing on uh, Indiana University's campus farm. And um, so we start, uh, we start in the spring, as I said, with, a, with seeds and um, we transplant then in May, right around the time of graduation. <laughs> graduation <laughs> weekend is usually when we transplant. And then, um, and, and then around the 4th of July, the plants are ready for a first cutting and then they grow up again and we do a second cutting and we, um, we dry the, the plants in the sun and then uh, winnow the leaves from the stems because the dye is only found in the leaves. And, um, and then that, those, uh, those dried leaves then get composted for a hundred days over the winter um, to concentrate the dye that's found in them. And this is a process that's really, um, if you look globally at indigo, there's a number of different ways of making, of take, you know, uh, indigo as a dye is found in lots of different plants, but the, the um, puzzle of getting it from the plant to, to uh, cloth um, is really uh, is a challenge that that um, different uh, processes evolved in different regions based on climate and available materials. So this is a method that um, was developed um, evolved in Japan. It's very similar to what evolved um, in Europe working with woad, um, where and it's very different from say uh, tropical indigo extractions where the um, plants are steeped in water and the dye is extracted. That's much more of a, a a tropical process. And maybe we can go to, to the next slide. I know that much of much of the work that you do is informed by 
um, time spent in, in Japan learning and growing. And so if you can talk a little bit about, about that experience and that background. Yeah, I, um, you know, so I lived in Japan for 10 years. Um, I spent my junior year abroad in college in Japan. And then when I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> and uh, never did I think I'd be in, in uh, you know, growing indigo in Indiana and teaching at uh, Indiana University. And so um, I went back to Japan, not really knowing what I, did, what I wanted to do to teach uh, English at a public high school. And um, in doing that, uh, I was also doing a lot of photography and um, I moved into an old farmhouse in the country and realized very quickly that all of the, the uh, water, like from the sink and from the bath and whatnot, all the gray water was running directly into the stream below uh, the house where I lived. And um, I started asking around and at the, at, I found out that the high school, um, this was where I was teaching, it was the same situation. And I had started, I'd been doing uh, black and white photography. I started a, a photo club with the students at the high school. We were, I taught them how to develop and print black and white. We were, you know, running stuff in the dark room all the time. And all of those chemicals were going down the drain and right into the water, mm. right into the stream, uh, stream and rivers. And um, it, it really very quickly opened my eyes to the impact of our making on, on our immediate environment. Um, and I think this is a challenge of us in, in uh, developed nations where we, you know, we uh, survive on global trade. We don't understand how things are made. We don't see how they're made. And um, so after realizing this, I stopped doing photography and I felt like I wanted to uh, do something else. Um, I met some folks uh, in, in the area who were working with natural dyes, they were going out, they were very conscious uh, because of where they lived atop this mountain of terraced rice fields, all the, all the um, runoff, anything they threw away, all their wastewater was going into the food source, they were uh, to, into the rice fields. And so they were very conscious about the types of uh, mordants that they were using, the types of plants they were using. And they sort of introduced me to this world of natural dyes. And while they weren't working with indigo, they, they sort of said, you know, well, there is this whole other dye called indigo out there. And um, that's still done in uh, Tokushima, mm -hmm. um, which is on the island of Shikoku. It's the smallest of the, the four main islands of Japan. And so when I was done um, teaching, I really felt like I wanted to bring something back with me uh, to the States. And so when that teaching contract I had there was up, um, I was able to set up an apprenticeship in Tokushima to learn how to grow and process indigo. Um, and my hope was um, that I would be able to, to, to bring that knowledge back um, instead of just having sort of lived in Japan for a couple of years. Um, I really wanted to, uh, I'd seen all around me um, in this rural community where I was living, where, where people had a lot of knowledge about living in the environment and making things and um, really sort of shrinking to, I, I saw that like these historical processes and techniques and so on really kind of shrink the distance of making something from this global scale to literally the distance of your own hands. Like I was living in a house that was made of, you know, uh, wood and straw and mud. And that was all from right there. It, these weren't two by fours that had been shipped globally or anything like that. It was all um, very immediate. And um, I wanted to bring back some of that knowledge and sh that shrinks that distance of making from the global to, to the distance of your own hands um, with me. And so I did, I did go to Tokushima and work as an apprentice there. And so can we go to the next slide, please? I think that that idea of um, a sense of place and bridging the sort of distance between um, uh, people and the things that they create and consume um, really, it, it, it ends up um, playing a big role in the piece that, that's part of the Renwick Invitational. And um, so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about Tokushima and your time there and, and, and then coming back to start to work on the piece that's, that's in um, the Renwick. Yeah, certainly. So this is, uh, this is an image of uh, Osamu Ni, who's the uh, indigo uh, farmer that I worked with. Um, and what he's doing here is he's adding water to a huge pile of composting indigo leaves. And um, so when I started, uh, when I went to Tokushima um, to study indigo, 
as an apprentice, I was very naive. I, I really didn't know. I knew nothing about Indigo. I was sort of had these blinders on and I'm like, oh, I want to do this thing. But I really didn't know what it was. I didn't know that there was synthetic Indigo that's derived from petroleum. I didn't know that there was Indigo in all these other cultures around the world mm -hmm. done different ways. And so I, I kind of jumped into this experience. And um, while I was in, I did a, a two year apprenticeship, one year working with the Ni family, um, learning to grow and process the plants. And then another year working with the Furusho family, learning how to take that composted indigo called sukumo and uh, ferment it in wood ash lye to make a, a, the traditional uh, dye vat. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to go down to uh, Okinawa and um, work with uh, some farmers down there who were growing the, uh, the traditional indigo there. And that is, a, is tropical and mm -hmm. they were doing um, extract an extraction method. And when I went there and saw that, it just sort of hit me really suddenly that, um, that just like cultures, um, you know, these, these traditions have evolved in a very specific place using the materials that are available um, and using the climate that's available. And, um, and with that then becomes, you, you have these um, sort of very, you have like, uh, I don't, I don't really even know how to describe it, but it's, it's really sort of this, it's very foundational to my own thinking, right? Like this is, um, this is a process. Um, one of the reasons I still work with this process is because um, it works where I live in Bloomington, right? I'm not mm -hmm. trying to transplant some like a tropical uh, process to, uh, to Indiana where clearly we're not tropical. It's below, it's uh, we're below freezing in it. No, so, but you've got the climate that makes sense to right, and it, yeah. it really does. It really does match up. But um, so one of the things um, in in looking at, at Tokushima, and it's also really amazing, interesting history why Tokushima is known for indigo because you this um, we probably should have included a map, but there's this huge <laughs> river called the Yoshino River that runs through uh, east to west across the prefecture of Tokushima, and um, it's it's a it's surrounded by a large fertile plain. And uh, that river used to flood with, uh, with typhoons in the late summer and fall, and, uh, particularly right around the time of uh, rice harvest. And historically, um, uh, rice was currency. So from the 1600s on, you had to pay taxes to the, to the uh, central government uh, in Tokyo through, through uh, rice. And this region had this uh, huge problem in that they, um, you know, the river would, right around the time of the rice harvest, the river would flood and wipe out the, their currency, essentially. So uh, the feudal lord decided to come up with another product uh, that they could trade for rice, and they struck on indigo. And um, about 400 and 450 years ago, they made a decision to really invest in research and development in uh, growing indigo uh, and then in, in processing it to make a superior uh, product. So this was done throughout Japan, but um, they really sort of uh, invested heavily in figuring out a way of doing it better. And um, it, it became uh, very much the foundation of the economy of the area. Um, a lot of the banks and other businesses that still exist there started out as indigo traders. Mm. Um, so it's the whole region was really, um, in, in you see towns named after uh, indigo. Um, it, the whole region was really um, steeped in indigo production and, and um, really uh, provided indigo dye to the rest of the country. And what's interesting is we tend to think of this historical, you know, this, this was a long time ago sort of thing, but actually the peak of indigo production in Tokushima, I think was somewhere around 1913. Mm. It was really only <laughs> like a little over a hundred years ago um, when the vast majority of land in that fertile plain was still producing indigo. Well, and it's, and it's, it's, you have kept going back to Tokushima. It, you've kept a relationship with the place. Um, and, and certainly the, the work that's in the Renwick exhibition was first mounted there. And so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so when we were selecting the theme for this year's Invitational, we were so excited about 
the sort of holistic and participatory way that you work um, bigger conversations about how nature and culture come together and that we were able to bring this work, um, Aino Keshiki, a piece that speaks directly to those ideas and which um, we're showing here in its iteration in Tokushima. We'll show some images of the installation at the Renwick a few slides on. Um, that we were able to bring it to the US for the first time was, was really an exciting prospect. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the genesis of, of the work. Yeah, so this, um, so yes, I do have connections to Tokushima. I do go back. <laughs> My wife is actually from Tokushima. We met uh, because we were apprentices with the same uh, dyer there. That's how we ended, that's how we met. Um, so first of all, on a personal level, <laughs> we go back to visit family. Um, but uh, as my own work has um, evolved, you know, I left Tokushima, I had just finished an apprenticeship and left and really hadn't de developed any of, of my own work. And then mm -hmm. I came back to the States and went to grad school to study art, really to kind of merge these two uh, worlds, m merge what I had learned in Japan with something really from my own uh, cultural background. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in doing that, I guess over the years, at some point, my work came to the attention of folks in the cultural affairs division of the Tokushima prefectural office. And um, they invited me in 2012 um, to develop a uh, public art project as part of um, the uh, uh, an event that happens every year in Japan, the National Cultural Festival, which they were hosting that year. Um, and then after that, we just sort of stayed in touch. They followed my work. I started doing a number of things with working with fading, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And that really kind of caught their attention um, because fading um, is in the, in the sort of standard conversations around cloth and it is, is something that you really don't want to happen, right? Um, and I kind of jumped in and really embraced that um, as a possibility, as an artistic possibility. And um, they had seen some of the work that I've been doing and um, asked me if I could develop another uh, sort of public art participatory project um, that worked with fading. And so this, this is where we landed, um, but, but getting there was, um, you know, was quite, uh, quite a process. But the, the, the sort of origins of it were um, the work that I was doing with fading. So if we can go to the next slide, that'll give us another really interesting view. This, um, I, I think the fact that fading comes into it so much and, and the installation itself um, really takes light and the role and the interaction between light and cloth into account, uh, particularly in, in this iteration really comes through strongly in, in this, this image of the piece. Yeah, and that that um, the the idea of fading um, really captures something, or the act of fading really captures something for me. And so we haven't really, um, you know, the, the the title is probably a mystery to people. Uh, <laughs> it's a I no keshiki. I in uh, in Japanese is indigo, so uh, the word for indigo, and uh, keshiki is a a view, and it can mean sort of a scenic view. But then within the tea ceremony, it also has this, uh, it has a uh, meaning of like the view of the, the tea bowl and the appreciation that you have for a, a bowl in the way that say a patina accumulates on the surface over time. And in that sense, it's this patina is not considered a stain. It's actually considered something, you know, to, beautiful and to be appreciated. So we wanted to kind of in incorporate that idea in here that the fading is not just the, the loss of color. Mm -hmm. And then the view, um, there's sort of a, a many, many layers to the meaning of view. Um, but in this case, the, um, the cloth was uh, put, in, um, put in boxes and, uh, and then participants lived with the dyed cloth for um, a number of months in their spaces. And the, the, the cloth really kind of had through this hole in the box where light could come in the cloth also had a view out on their lives so there's um a number a number of layers to that idea of a, of a view and sort of who's who's looking at whom it's a very it's it's um 
this idea of an object sort of bearing witness to people's lives, I think is really a powerful one. And it's, and it's, you know, it happens with every object that's in our, <laughs> in our immediate surroundings, but to have something that you're going to intentionally bring into your home, let it be there for a portion of your life. And then it comes back into community is one of the things that I think is so sort of beautiful and, and lyrical about this particular work. Um, and I know the boxes, um, you know, they're an integral part, not just of the process of the fading, which I think f folks can see from, from this image, it's really different depending on where the, the folk, people put the, the participants put the cloths in their home. Um, but then those boxes, sorry, Glory, we can go to the next slide. Um, they were later integrated into the installation of the piece, but here they are sort of in there, <laughs> um, you know, looking very unassuming and, and um, you know, just existing as a part of, um, a part of people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think we're starting here to look at <laughs> A video and we can roll in if you want to talk a little bit about what's happening here about translating the work to the Renwick, um, bringing what was a site specific installation into this new context. Yeah, and so one of the things those boxes really became central in thinking about how the whole how to lay out the work. So in Tokushima, you saw that it's sort of a very dark space with this light illuminating everything from a single point and that really wasn't possible with this space and, and trying to think about how to reconfigure it. Um, but also really wanted to preserve this idea of the box and light and the experience of the cloth in, inside the box um, and the view that, that it had. Um, so you can see we went through a lot of iterations. First, sort of just <laughs> thinking about a form where how light might enter the, um, enter the box and, and hit the cloth. Um, and then uh, where those sort of visions and dreams of an artist meet the hard <laughs> realities of um, space limitations and rules about how far things have to be from walls for people to get around them. Um, you know, how do you, how do you fit something into a space? Um, initially, the idea was to kind of have it all contained. And then at some point I realized like, no, it doesn't need to be contained. These forms can, can move, essentially imply that they move through the walls and out into the world. So, and we kind of worked to create a passageway through. I also felt that was very important to see the work both from the inside and the outside, um, which is again, sort of this idea of, you know, we could see the cloth from the outside of the box, but it was mm -hmm. kind of seeing us from inside. Um, so uh, having those multiple uh, perspectives on the work was really important. So having something that, that the viewers could move through and then really to kind of bring in the, um, to bring in the sense of um, the way that light uh, moved, the light moved across the surface of the cloth that it was as it was in the box, as, as the sun moves across the sky, mm. um, we were able to uh, work um, with a lighting designer to develop a system where the lights um, are in constant motion, both, um, uh, both sort of up and down, but then also in the, the varying amount of brightness. Um, and so uh, if you go to see the work, you, you will see it like this, but you may have to wait another uh, 30, 40, 50 minutes for it to look something like this again. Mm -hmm. Can you, can we go to the next slide, please? Just to get, we'll get a different, a different sort of view on, on the piece. And I'm wondering one, one of the really exciting um, uh, pieces of sort of you know, um, I don't know if I would call it kismet because it was it was both problem solving and, <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, something that sort of added additional context to the piece was in your work with the lighting designers at the Renwick, um, figuring out um, this system of lighting that was generative in a way that the sound in your work is often generative but which also took this idea of bearing witness that's a part of this piece and linked it to what's happening with the, um, with the COVID epidemic. Yeah, so one of the, um, you know, thinking for, for, for me to be able to, you know, when you think about the site of the, the Renwick Gallery, it's like as close to across the street from the White House as you can get. 
Mm -hmm. And to, so putting this work in, in that context, one of the things that I, I felt with fading and seeing the, seeing when we installed this in Tokushima, something that really struck me about the work was the, the way that the cloth moves in unison. And it, it really struck me then, um, and this is a huge, this is a challenge that I think all artists who work in installation struggle with because you don't actually get to see the work until it's up. Right. I don't have a space like that where I can install it and test it out in advance. And, and so um, seeing the work in person um, and as people moved through it, it reacted and it's almost as if it was breathing with them. And it really um, made me aware that fading is a sort of like is very much like breathing. Mm. It's an exchange. Um, and so even with the with the fading that we had, the, the cloth is sort of breathing in the lives and spaces of the participants. And at the same time, it's exhaling its own color out into their spaces. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's really this sort of um, sense of breath or breathing throughout the work, which felt very um, clearly relevant to our, to our current moment. And so, um, you know, there's sort of a logic behind the way that the work is laid out. Um, there's a logic behind the, the sound and the way the sound um, evolves. And so Norbert Herber, who developed the sound and I, we um, worked uh, and, and, uh, with Robbie Hayes at Pixel Lumen and, um, and Scott Rosenfeld, the, um, the uh, lighting designer at the Smithsonian, and really developed something. We wanted it to have its own logic. We didn't want it to be um, dependent upon something happening in the space. Mm -hmm. um, and so the light, the light evolves based on um, uh, aggregated uh, global COVID data, to, to put it simply. Um, and so there are times when you're in there where it will be very, it, it'll be dark. Um, there'll be sort of one light bulb on very dimly. There's other times where it'll be more like this and much brighter with much more intense shadows uh, being cast. But it felt like a very appropriate um, addition to the work, sort of given its um, given its placement and given our current condition, where where we really are, I think more than ever aware of our interdependence and the challenges that that um, isolation creates. Absolutely, and it's and and that ability for the work to sort of continuously live and grow and change. Um, and to go through new cycles of being, I think, has some some nice parallels with 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 the larger processes that that you've talked about. Um, I'm wondering if we want to look at um, just a little bit of a, a sort of behind the scenes installation in the next slide that that shows how the piece um, <laughs> how the piece came to be in the gallery. And if you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing as as we watch this. Yeah, so to, to install this work, we had to, um, we created an armature and then sort of slowly added layer by layer of, of cloth as we then lifted the whole armature up to fit it into the space. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, five days of uh, eight to 10 hour days condensed down into like 30 seconds uh, <laughs> to actually get the, to get the work um, installed and hung. And if we can go to the next slide. I love some of these close-up images where you can really see that sort of overlapping, the way that the cloths um, uh, sort of relate to one another, the fact that there are these differences from element to element. And of course, when people have a chance to spend time in the galleries, their bodies, the way that they move in the space impacts the sort of broader movement of, of the piece. Um, the other sort of wonderful, changeable part about your piece, if we can go to the next well, let's let actually we'll introduce it is is this um, you've referenced it this regular collaboration with Norbert Herber the sound um, artist who has worked with you on many installations and so um, I don't know if do you want to listen to a little bit of the sound first and then talk about sure. it or okay. So 
while it doesn't necessarily sound like it, um, a lot of the sound is actually derived um, directly or indirectly from uh, things related to the physical process. You know, and, Gloria, can we go to the next slide? So we've got a little bit of the yeah. sound, but I think it'll... Okay, sorry, yeah. So the, the sound is really derived from um, uh, various, uh, directly or indirectly from various parts of the indigo process. And um, one of the things that I think is really uh, was a was a challenge is that the, the spaces are very different. The space that it was shown in Tokushima and the Renwick. So um, in Tokushima, there was a huge arc of 48 speakers and it was this sort of cavernous space and Norbert worked very hard to get the sound to sort of move through the space, much like the light would was was moving um, through the through the boxes. Mm. And um, but that had actually not been his original idea. And, and uh, you know, re rethinking this work for the Renwick created an opportunity to kind of go back to that original idea, which was to have these very sort of small, delicate sounds related uh, to the indigo process coming out of the speaker boxes. And the boxes are made from the boxes that were used for fading the cloth. And there, uh, there's small speakers in there. And it, it gives a sense, um, if, uh, if when you get to see the show at the Renwick, um, it, and you can, you can go up and listen to them, it really gives a sense of these sort of voices of this process um, reaching back through that, that void in the box um, to where the light wants passed to really leave a, a, um, this sort of impression on you through, through sound. Um, and if we can go to the next image, we can see a little bit um, more closely how those speaker boxes so so they really are there on the wall you can get fairly um, right. close to them yeah and they're, they're sort of hung at ear height so you can kind of hear these small delicate sounds coming through um, and they're really sort of speaking about the color uh, that or the forces really and all the work and everything that went into bringing that color to the cloth mm. well i this is fantastic, Roland. Thank you so much for sharing so much about your work and, and this piece in depth with us. I wanna make sure that we have time for some questions from um, the audience. And I know Caroline is gonna be um, sharing those with us. So um, hopefully we'll have some great questions from you. Thank you so much, guys. That was a wonderful conversation. And you're right, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience, but while we wait for some of those to come in, I have, a hopefully quick one for Roland, which is if you can make an installation anywhere, time and money were no objection, what would you like to do or where would you like to do it? I, I have this, this dream of doing something that just, uh, that isn't in one specific place, but simply moves about that are sort of like huge, uh, huge, huge flags um, that I just have this vision of like me standing with this like giant flag for days on end until it fades um, and moving from point to point around uh, the world really traveling with it. I don't know why, it's I have no logic behind it. But <laughs> If somebody wants to, to, to support a large scale flag project, <laughs> let, let Roland know, let us know, it sounds fabulous. <laughs> oh, and I think that that sounds like a great idea. I completely agree. And I also wondered because um, all the installations I've seen have been inside and because your work is so tied to the natural rhythms, it occurred to me that maybe you'd like to do one outside. It sounds like you do. So on a very similar note, someone actually asked a pretty practical question. And I think this is important to address because so often this is a very behind the scenes, how do museums and artists operate question of when your work's not being displayed or you know is installed somewhere generally, what do you do with it? How do you take care of it? So um, <laughs> uh... It's a, it's a challenge. One of the goals for this project, and it's something that I started doing, I, I, I tried for a long time to, to sort of make it, make, make a living uh, sort of dyeing textiles and selling them. And I was not very particularly good at it. And so I, um, one of the reasons I started working with installations or one of the joys I think of working with installation is you end up with something that you really, it's not necessarily commodifiable. And so in other projects that I've done, I started thinking about, um, the second life of the installation. And um, in this case, all of this cloth was meant to go back to people, sort of like as it faded in their lives, 
it, it gathered meaning in that faded mark. And then by, by being in these installations, it gains a whole other set of meaning. And then it would go back to people. They could do whatever they want with it. If they want to frame it, put it on the wall, great. If they want to make something out of it, great. Um, but at the end, that there wouldn't be anything left because that's part of the problem, right? The accumulation of all this stuff is, is, is part of our problem. So to kind of put it back into another cycle um, where cloth is a consumable, where it would then get used um, is really ideal because I have other things that are living in crates and they just take up more and more space and I have less and less space to do things because they're just, they're taking up space. And Roland, if, if, if I'm remembering correctly, the indigo plants that were that were in the installation in Boston um, went back and uh, went back into the dye process. They became part of the next cycle of, of creating cloth. Exactly. So there's this sort of they're not there anymore. Right. <laughs> but they are, but they live on in these other forms, right? Mm hmm. And I suppose that actually leads to the next question, which is a little bit more abstract. And um, someone asks, what do you feel that indigo or this process of being so intimately tied to indigo's growth cycle has taught you, whether that means abstractly within your art or just conceptually for you as you navigate through life as a person? With, without sounding horribly um, like a downer, uh, I think that it's taught me about a real uh, profound beauty to human futility. And I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of futility, right? Like we work so hard to make all this stuff. And like, I spend so much time and energy making a color that doesn't really even exist as a thing in and of itself, right? It's just a reflection of a wavelength of light. And yet we're, as, as people were, and, and, and I think, you know, I'm making cloth, right? Cloth, it gets worn, it fades, it fades, <laughs> it falls apart. Um, and, and it will, and, and yet we continue to do this, right? Even though we know that it's going to fade, we know that it's going to fall apart. I think as humans, we're driven to do this for better or for worse. Um, and to me, that's sort of a, a deeply fascinating aspect of, or a potential of, of this work. So building on that a little bit, uh, one person asks about, um, you know, so much of your work is focused on consistency and time, um, which of course has changed with the pandemic. All of our timelines have sort of shifted, but they're wondering in a much larger scale, um, has uh, the rising data about um, climate change or any effects of climate change that you've seen in your environment, has that affected the way that you think about your work or the future of your work? Um, not directly, no. I mean, I think it's something that, uh, that all of us think about. Those of us growing things think about it maybe more than, more than others, um, because it does impact sort of when you can, um, you know, when you can plant, when you can harvest, um, what, you know, what winters are like. Um, it's not something that I've in really engaged directly with um, in, in my work. No, thank you for that. Um, the next question is actually about the sound in the installation. Someone equated it to temple bells or wind chimes. And could you say more about it, how it was created, what it means? Just dive into that a little bit because it is such a, a wonderful experience of actually being in the gallery for those of us who have had that privilege. Right, one of, you know, uh, it, one, Norbert could do this much more justice than I can. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that you notice visually in the, in the work is that there are these points on each of the cloth and some are more distinct than others. Some are much more visible, some are much more subtle. Um, and so some of the sound, um, the, the experience of the sound is also sort of mimicking that, that mark and, and the light um, and the way the light uh, hit, hit the cloth and has left a mark. Um, so that's definitely sort of, the, um, sort of the punctuation of the sound, that's part of it. Very cool. Um, uh, speaking to process again, someone wonders if you sketch out your ideas, do you keep a journal? You know, you mentioned being an installation artist primarily, you don't actually get to see it in full manifestation until it's in its uh, like intended space. And so how do you work through that? Um, I used to make models. I used to, I, I um, at one point wanted to be an architect. So I used to love to make scale models of everything and cut out little pieces of cloth and hang them in there. And, uh, but now I, I largely use uh, SketchUp or other 3D uh, 
uh, modeling software to um, to to really understand what it will look like because so much planning has to go in place. Like we had to have that armature built before we went to install because we had five days to install. Um, you know, it has to be mapped out really well. And um, I have to say that three three D modeling software makes that a lot easier, and it makes it very easy to get measurements and numbers off of in a way that is much more challenging with the scale model. Yeah, absolutely. And if you mess up, you can change it versus being stuck with the incorrect model. Yep, can totally relate to that. And so, actually, the last question I have is for both of you, um, and it's a little bit sideways, but I think it's a nice point to end on you know you're both educators in your own right in different fields but i'm wondering if you have any advice for particularly emerging artists that are coming into this crazy wild ride of a, a, a world we have right now i mean it's always pretty wild but if there's anything that you feel like is an essential piece of advice that you would give to anyone absolutely um and it's very simple uh keep keep making keep making. That's really like, you know, it's, I think it's really hard um, as, as a young artist, um, you have to believe in yourself a thousand times more than anybody else believes in you to actually um, be able to continue making. And so just keep, keep making. I often like, like, I, I can't draw to save my life. Um, and although I took drawing classes in college and uh, my wife always jokes that like, I'm, an, I'm a professor of art and I can't draw, right? I have no particular uh, great set of talents. Um, I just have continued doing what I believe in on my own terms. I would, I would add one thing to that. So keep making, but also allow yourself to have some time where you're focused on process rather than outcome. Um, I think that that Roland's work is a really fantastic example of, of how really digging deep into process and letting yourself explore and marinate in the act of making can lead you to some really compelling um, conceptual and thematic places. Thank you both for that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the journey, not the destination. <laughs> Um, and I think with that, we've reached the end of our time together. But before I let you go, I just want to say thank you so much to our wonderful participants, Emily and Roland, and to our audience for your time and attention. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. And it's actually so great to see so many friends in the audience. For more information about programming related to the Invitational, please check out Sam's calendar of upcoming events. And for more contemporary textile programming, please check out the GW Textile Museum's website. And with that, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>